Hi folks, welcome back to the bench. Today I want to do a talk on forcing cones. Uh, what a forcing cone is, what it does for you, how it, how it functions in the revolver, and some important things to note on taking care of a revolver depending on how its forcing cone is. Uh, so we've got four fantastic revolvers out here in front of us, beautiful pieces. Got a Smith & Wesson model 66-2. In 357 Magnum, everything here is in 357 Magnum. Got a Colt Python 2020 variant. Got uh, both of these are Smith & Wesson Model 19-4s. So a little bit earlier than than this uh, Model 66, and all of them uh, quite a bit quite a bit older. Uh, this one is the newest of the Smith & Wessons manufactured in 19. 87. So let's take a look here and talk about what a forcing cone is first and foremost. A forcing cone is simply the end of your barrel right here. And what it really is in particular is the inside area of the barrel. On the end here. What it has is a taper cut into it. So your rifling in the barrel does not begin immediately. It actually begins a little bit further in. Not very far, maybe a oh, quarter inch or so. Kind of hard to measure it, but it's just a tapered cone inside this leading edge of the barrel here. And the purpose of that is that it behaves the same way a lead does in a integrated chamber barrel system, like you'd have on pretty much anything that isn't a revolver where your chamber and barrel are all one piece. The function of a lead is that it gives your, your bullet, your projectile, a chance to begin moving forward before it engages the rifling. Because what you have to do is you have to have that rifling cut into the projectile. It has to cut into the bullet so that it can stabilize it and form a good tight seal. You don't want that to happen too early uh, in some cases. Sometimes you do want it to happen relatively soon, but for the most part, you don't want it to happen immediately. Because what will happen there is you'll get a, a, very, high, a very high pressure situation where that projectile trying to cut the rifling while it's also trying to get moving, all this powder is burning and it's, it's expending energy, it's creating all this gas. And if it's trying to get the bullet moving and also cut into the bullet at the same time, it offers a lot of resistance and you get pressure spikes that are not ideal. And in some cases can be very unsafe. If you've got a projectile that is too large for the lead in a particular chamber, uh, you can get into an unsafe situation where you're overstraining the cartridge case and can, can cause a rupture, cause a failure, which can be dangerous both to the firearm and to uh, the person using it. So you gotta make sure that you're aware of that kind of danger. Not a problem uh, as long as you're using pretty normal stuff, but when you get into sort of specialty things, that can be an issue. But getting off on that tangent, on a revolver, it also serves the very important function of if you have any kind of misalignment of the cylinder. Let's look at this Smith & Wesson, because this one is definitely the most worn of these revolvers, is that if you have any misalignment of the cylinder, and you can see this one even, even in a decocked, trigger-pulled configuration, there is a little bit of play here little bit of play. It's an older gun. It's been shot. So it has a little, little slot there. And so on a revolver, you have to make sure that the bullet actually gets into the barrel, uh, obviously. So if these were completely lined up, totally perfectly, but then this has slop, well, 
well, you're going to be shaving off pieces of the bullet here, which isn't good either. So you have to have that forcing cone there to, for one, collect the projectile as it leaves the chamber, and then get it into the rifling and cutting into the rifling smoothly so it can go downrange. Now let's talk about what issues exist with forcing cones. On this Colt Python here, which we've already looked at some, you can see that it is definitely built from the ground up to be a Magnum revolver. The, the forcing cone here, the barrel around it, is a completely full and round profile. See that? It's just a whole concentric circle. There's no, there's no weakness here. Now, because of that, if we look here, this revolver has a fairly large cylinder. It's going to be hard to really see that on camera probably, but the Colt's cylinder is bigger. It's larger in diameter than the Smith & Wesson cylinders. It's a bigger gun, even though they're roughly the same size. This is bigger. All six shots, but this cylinder is wider. You might say, oh, well, that's because they have to make it thicker because, well, no, they don't have to make it thicker for that reason. It isn't thicker to make the cylinder stronger. It's thicker because what you have to do and what Smith & Wesson has done on these older revolvers here to get around this issue is if you want to make it smaller, you create weakness, not in the cylinder. The cylinder is still perfectly capable of, of handling 357 Magnum you end up with a weakness here. Because to bring in that size, that dimension, to make this all more compact, they have to trim off the very bottom of the barrel right here. See? I think you can see it, yeah. It's trimmed off. They've cut off some of the bottom of that barrel. And that creates a point of weakness, which is okay. It's not a big deal, really. Uh, particularly on these two, not much of a problem at all. Uh, they trim it up so they can get a smaller cylinder. And this is a holdover from the old Model 10s where they were firing 38 Special. And really these, at their onset, were intended to mainly fire 38 Special. They are capable of that firing 57, 357 Magnum. They're capable of it, but they were not ever really intended to have a steady diet of 357. They, you, the idea wasn't to shoot 357 through these all the time because you've weakened. It's a small frame that's intended for 38 Special. It's not a uh, in frame, it's a K frame. It's a 38 Special frame that they made work with 357 Magnum. And it does work, as long as you're not going to steady the diet of, of Magnum ammunition, because that can start causing issues where that weak area will crack. You'll crack the forcing cone, and then your barrel is, is toast. That's, that's the end of your barrel. And sometimes when the forcing cone cracks, it also, if it cracks violently enough, can split the frame itself. And then your revolver is, is pretty much no more. Now, there's an additional exception to that. And that is for a period of time in the 1970s from sometime around and it's hard to, to pinpoint exactly when, sometime around probably about 1972 through about 1979 or thereabouts. Just anything in the 70s would be a little bit suspect, but Smith & Wesson for a period of time was having issues with the gas ring, which we talked about in another video, the gas ring on the front 
uh, the cylinder was coming out. It was coming loose. It was causing them some issues. And so they moved the gas ring from the cylinder face to be a separate part on the yoke. And that didn't work really all that well. It, it caused some problems with not functioning well as a gas ring. It was still letting uh, crud, carbon, debris, firing residue build up and cause issues with cylinder rotation. Now this model 19-4, which they introduced in 1977, does have the gas ring on the cylinder face. So this is the, when they returned back from using the yoke mounted gas ring, this one is actually on the cylinder, just like these others are. Unfortunately, when they put that gas ring on the cylinder for just a, just a few years, just a couple years really, when they put that gas ring on the cylinder, it took up more space. And as a result, they had to cut out even more of the barrel than they previously had. So if you look here, and it's gonna be hard to compare them side by side. And it's not much of a difference. You kind of have to, to know more or less what you're looking for to be able to tell. But this one is thinner. It has just a little bit more, you know, probably a few thousands more 5,000, something like that. Uh, it's perceptible, but it's not much. But it has more of a cutout here on the bottom than either of these other two. Even though they switched back to the cylinder-mounted gas ring. The issue that with that is that they never switched back after they... I said never... No, once they switched back to putting the gas ring on the cylinder, they didn't switch back the manufacturing process to take off less material here until later on. So they carried on with this modification where they had to take more material off even after they had switched back to, to a cylinder-mounted gas ring. And so that means that in addition to these already being weak, which is a holdover from 38 special days where it really didn't matter. These are 357 Magnum intended to not be fired with a lot of Magnum ammunition. And it's okay. It's okay that it has that weakness. Now you have a 357 Magnum in a time period where shooting Magnum loads frequently is becoming more and more common. And you've got additional weakness beyond what was even considered acceptable for 38 Special. You've got a higher pressure, higher energy cartridge working against a weaker forcing cone than even the 38 Special in the Model 10 was intended to deal with. So you've kind of got the worst of both worlds here. So what does this tell you? Well, it tells you that Probably I'll look at your revolver and see what your forcing cone situation is, particularly on these older Smith & Wessons, if you have a thinned out forcing cone from the 19-3 time period. But it also comes in, to, this is 19-4, it also carries over into some of the early 19-4 production and to some of the uh, Model 66 no-dash production. So you need to take a look there and see what the situation is. Now, if you have this situation where you've got this thinned out forcing cone, what should you do? I would say stick with 38 Special, stick with 38 Plus P. Shooting Magnums in these is probably not the smartest idea for longevity of the gun. Now, some folks are gonna say, oh, well, I've had one for, you know, I bought it new in 1974 and I've been shooting it for, you know, all that time and I've not had any problems with it and I only shoot 357 Magnum because, you know, whatever. If you got lucky, congratulations. But with this being 
a powerful cartridge with a forcing cone that is weakened beyond what was even uh, considered good for 38 Special, you're really gambling every time you fire magnums in these. You are risking cracking that forcing cone and, and possibly even cracking your frame below the forcing cone where it's thin right here. And then that's the end of your revolver if that happens. So if you want to preserve this, this piece of history, this piece of beautiful American craftsmanship, I would stick with 38s. Maybe 38 plus P if you want to keep it as a bedside gun or something. But firing 357 Magnum in these, probably not the best idea. Now, the Model 19 and the Model 66 here, 66-2, 19-4, that have the more full forcing cone that's still shaved, what about those? I think it's okay to shoot your Magnums in them. But, so let's look at this one here. So this one has the full thickness. Well, not full thickness, but doesn't have the additionally reduced thickness forcing cone. So what should you do with that? These are both the same on that regard. What should you do with that? You can shoot through seven magnum in them. I have, I do. I would say don't make a habit of it all the time. Uh, if you want to shoot a few every once in a while to kind of you know, just get the feel for it, that's that's okay. Nothing really wrong with that, probably. I wouldn't shoot 357 Magnum through these constantly. I wouldn't make it a habit. If you are shooting 357 Magnum, I would try, if at all possible, to avoid the 125 grain, go with like the 158s, because that 158, being a heavier bullet, takes more time to get moving, and it impacts the forcing cone at a lower velocity. Those 125s, when they're really trying to push the velocity out of them, those things get moving so fast that they really smack that forcing cone hard, and you're you're running a risk of just that, that kinetic energy coming in causing a crack, whereas the 158s, they're getting moving slower, the velocity's lower, and they're going to be a lot more gentle on that forcing cone. I still wouldn't make a habit of shooting a lot of 158 magnums in these, but if you can go to 158 magnums, the 158 grain, 357 magnum, that is going to help with preventing damage. Um, but again, these are classic revolvers. The newest one of these, uh, Smith & Wesson's, is 1987. I mean, these are, I don't want to say pieces of, of history, really, but in a way they are. They, they are classic American revolvers. And for the most part, shoot, a, shoot them mostly with 38 Special. Uh, that's what really these designs were intended to accommodate way back at the Model 10. And these are all here really just variations of the Model 10 souped up a little bit to handle 357 Magnum, and then in this case, further compromised beyond even the prior design. So if you want to shoot 357 Magnum, look at something that has a fully supported forcing cone like this Python does, and like the Smith & Wesson Model 686 does. That's the whole point of the Model 686 with that L-frame, is to give it just that little bit of extra size that it needs, that little bit bigger cylinder, that's 686 has a bigger cylinder than like the 66 or the 19, that little bit of extra room so that a fully supported forcing cone is a possibility. They make the revolver just a little bit bigger so they don't have to trim out the bottom of the barrel there to accommodate the gas ring, to accommodate the, the crane, the yoke. Just that little bit of extra room allows them to fully support the forcing cone and give it that extra strength that it needs to really safely, for the gun, for the longevity of the gun, handle 
357 Magnum, 125 grain, high velocity stuff, and accommodate that in a way that isn't damaging to the revolver. Obviously with anything, the higher pressure stuff you're shooting, you're creating additional wear and tear on the gun, you're creating frame stretch, you're, you're putting more wear and tear regardless, no matter which gun it is. But especially on these older pieces and these, these mid seventies Smith and Wessons, like this one here, you're running additional risk by shooting 357 Magnum in it, particularly the 125s. Um, so this one here, which is actually on loan to me for this video, I would recommend only shooting 38 Special in it, maybe 38 Special plus P, and probably trying to avoid 357 Magnum entirely. Uh, if anything, maybe a, maybe a little bit of 158, but probably best to stick with 38s, 38 plus P. On these, where they do have partial support, or more support, but still partially unsupported. Shoot your 357s in them. Uh, try to go with 158s, if possible. A little bit of 125 probably won't kill them, but you are running a risk there. Uh, but mainly, just shoot 38s and you'll be fine. Now, when it comes to a 686, which obviously this isn't, I don't have a 686. A 686 or something like the Python here, where they have that full support on the forcing cone. Shoot the mags, magnums in it. I mean, you're not really creating too much additional wear and tear on the revolver doing it, but you know, it, it's made for it. It's intended to, to handle 357 Magnum. So I think that's about all I had for you. Uh, thanks for watching. If you like this kind of stuff, like and subscribe. Dig back through and see some of the other videos we talk about revolver mechanics in. Kind of interesting stuff. It's probably a little lo more long-winded than it needed to be, but really wanted to break it down and explain you know, what the risks are and what what you need to do to avoid damage. Uh, so take it as you will, and uh, see you guys next time. Bye.